Uh, next, we're going to cover all the odontocetes. These are the toothed whales. So the whales and dolphins that actually have teeth in their mouths instead of these baleen plates. Uh, another point about the odontocetes, they only have one blowhole on the top of their head, just one. And they have this melon we talked about with the anatomy, and they have the ability to echolocate. And we have about 20 species of this, these in the Maldives. So echolocation. Echolocation is the production of high frequency sounds. Uh, so we're talking above 120 kilohertz. Uh, this can range beyond our hearing. So much, much higher than we have the ability to hear, they're creating these sounds. So let's see if it works. No. Um, and these sounds, uh, when they are echolocating, it's sort of like clicks, clicks. And with some of the dolphin species, when they click very, very rapidly together, it almost just sounds like a buzz. And what happens with these sounds, they send them out into the environment and they bounce back off any objects that they meet. And as they bounce back, the odontocetes are able to pick up the sound waves through their lower jaw and they have some acoustic fats which then translate these sounds into a picture for them. So they are able to determine the physical structure of their environment with these sounds, and they also use it to hunt, to locate and hunt their prey. And bats. Bats are another example of an animal that use echolocation, using sound, sometimes called biosonar, to be able to hunt and to see where they are going. With the dolphins, they found through that blowhole inside, they have phonic lips, also called the monkey lips. And then these slap together, it creates the sound. And this sound then travels through the melon, through their skull, and it is focused. It can either be a broad or it can be a very focused beam of sound. Okay, so our first odontocete is the sperm whale. This is the largest of all the toothed whales, up to 18 meters in length. So another big animal. It's very much a submarine shape. Humans, we actually model the shape of our submarines after the sperm whale, because they are deep diving animals and they are streamlined, so we modeled our submarines on their shape. A lot of human engineering can come back to the animal kingdom. Another identification feature for the sperm whales is when they blow, their blow goes off to the left and is very, very bushy, a angled blow. For them, inside their head, about two thirds of their head, they have an organ called the spermaceti organ. And this helps them to dive. Basically, in there you have the spermaceti. It's a very viscous material, very viscous uh, substance, which they can either make more dense or less dense. So when they want to dive, they will make it more dense, they will make it heavier to make themselves negatively buoyant so they can sink. And once they're done foraging, they'll then make it less dense so they can surface again. So if they're divers out there, when you control your buoyancy underwater, this is what they're using, their spermaceti organ. And unfortunately, um, this substance burns very, very well. So this is why sperm whales were targeted uh, during the whaling industry for this organ and for this material. But the sperm whale diving down over 2,000 meters. They've been recorded down to 3,000 meters. And they're going after squid. They're going after the giant, colossal-sized squid, which, with their head and all the tentacles, can almost be the same length as the sperm whale. And in some of the older sperm whales, you'll, they'll have scars. Where the squid have tried to fight back, their faces will be scratched with scars. And if anybody's read uh, Moby Dick, um, Moby Dick is basically an albino sperm whale, a white sperm whale. Okay, our dwarf sperm whale. Unfortunately, the majority of uh, data and knowledge we have about this animal is strandings data. Um, very small, about 2.7 meters, 
also diving down very deep after squid, fish, and crustaceans that live in the deep. They have a dark blue olive skin and very sort of pointed nose, like, um, like the pointer dogs. But there's very little known about this, um, this dwarf sperm whale. And another sort of mysterious group of whales are our beaked whales. Um, again, most of the data we have on this group is from strandings, so when they've washed up on beaches um, dead. They're all deep diving, again, 1,000, 2,000 meters after deep sea squid. Uh, we have five species of them here in the Maldives, and they're very difficult to identify in the field. They're very difficult to identify. Uh, between four and seven meters. And with the beaked whales, because they are hunting so deep, usually the food they want is in some of the deep water canyons, the canyons that we have underwater. And unfortunately, this is where when navies around the world are testing out their sonar systems, to try and detect submarines, the submarines will also hide in these canyons. So when they send down the sonar to try and locate the submarine and it hits a group of beaked whales, it scares them. And what happens in a lot of cases, they shoot to the surface too fast, and then they wash up uh, dead on beaches. And a lot of research going on, on th at the moment, it's starting to become more and more accepted, that they've died from decompression sickness. Uh, so same that humans suffer from if, uh, when we dive, they get a buildup of nitrogen in their tissue. And what they would usually do is rise very slowly to the surface. And in some cases, they'll come up, take a breath, and they'll go down, maybe back down to 50 meters or so to do what we would call a safety stop. But when they are startled in these situations, they just shoot to the surface. They ignore their usual safety procedures. And then they end up uh, stranding on the beaches. And when they're autopsied, these gas bubbles are found in their tissues. So they're sort of the evidence for marine mammals suffering possibly also from decompression sickness. So our five uh, the five beaked whales that we have, uh, this one is our Cuvier's beaked whale. Um, he's a little bit distinctive because his head is white, a uh, white head. And then the rest of them, all very similar. They'll have the scratch marks again from those squid trying to fight back, trying to avoid being eaten. And for here in the Maldives, the ginkgo toothed beaked whale and the atoll beaked whale have only been identified from strandings. They haven't been seen actually in the wild. Our short finned pilot whales. Um, so we're now in our Delphinidae family. They have large bulbous heads about seven meters, and distinctive for them, the base of their dorsal fin is very, very wide, a very wide base to their dorsal fin. They live in warm waters. Um, in cooler waters, we get the long-finned pilot whales. They like their deep water because, again, they're hunting uh, deep water squid. And the pilot whales are very highly social. So you'll find usually quite a large number of them traveling together. And it's a matchy line. You get families traveling together. And in some situations, these really strong social bonds that they have is actually to their detriment. Uh, we'll get pilot whales mass strand as well. And what they'll find is there would have been one member of the family that was sick. And because they were sick, they ventured into shallow water, but the rest of the family followed to sort of try to look after them. Because they're so um, social, they've got such good family, strong ties, strong bonds, they're trying to care for the sick, but it leads all of them into shallow water, and then you'll get a mass stranding event because they followed one family member. Our orca. Um, also sometimes called the killer whale. Uh, this is the largest of the Delphinidae family. So it's the largest dolphin, up to about 10 meters. Black with these very characteristic white patches. Uh, one of the most easily identified whale or dolphin out there. With the male, their dorsal fin can reach two meters in height. Two meters for the males. And worldwide, uh, we actually have three types of orca. 
They've just identified the offshore, the offshore subgroup. And the other two, we have the transients and the residents. The residents only eat fish. Uh, these are the ones you'll get uh, big family groups living together, Iceland, Norway, uh, Vancouver, around Vancouver Island. So they tend to be more in temperate waters where there's a large supply of fish. So herring, mackerel, salmon, they love their salmon. So they stay quite local, it's the name residents. And then we have our transients. Uh, these are the ones that have been identified here in the Maldives. These are the ones that hunt other mammals. So seals, sea lions, whales, other dolphins. And they are the ones we find in a few places, uh, tropical waters around the world. And for the orca, highly intelligent species. Highly intelligent and highly social. Um, so on the bottom picture here, we have, uh, they call sort of, uh, they're half beaching themselves to hunt. So if there's a seal or a sea lion on the beach, they'll half beach themselves, follow it up on the beach, and then drag that animal back into the water. And this is very, very dangerous because if they get stuck and they can't shuffle themselves back into the water, uh, they will end up dying. And what we'll see is mothers teaching their calves how to do this. They will spend days, weeks even, training their young how to do this safely. Um, they show some of the most complex forms of cooperative hunting that has ever been seen in the animal kingdom. Um, if anybody saw the BBC series Frozen Planet, um, fantastic clip came out from there, orcas hunting seals down in Antarctica. You get a group of them together, they swim, they create a wave that then washes the seal off a of pack ice. That's the most complex form of cooperative hunting ever seen in the animal kingdom. And just a little sub note for orca, an orca has never attacked a human being in the wild. False killer whales. Um, so looking up to about six meters, um, uniformly dark gray or black, very, very rounded head. Um, just found in tropical and subtropical waters. Again, feeding on those large open water pelagic fish. And they do sometimes attack other smaller members of the dolphin family. The pygmy killer whale, uh, up to about 2.6 meters, so quite small. Dark gray, sometimes black. And they have a sort of dark cape from just in front of their dorsal fin down their back, a dark cape. They're trying to be Batman with their cape. And they have white lips. They've got some white lipstick on. Again, found in tropical and subtropical waters and feeding on these deep water fish and squid. So that's what's fantastic here in the Maldives. You don't need to go far offshore to hit very deep water. So you get a lot of these animals that like the deep oceanic waters around here. The melon-headed whale, uh, about 2.8 meters maximum. Again, dark gray or black. They don't have that cape, um, so just dark gray or black. But again, they have the white lips. Uh, quite a slim, slender body, and offshore in tropical and subtropical waters. Feeding again on the pelagic fish and squid. Okay, our Fraser's dolphin, 2.7 meters. They're sort of a bluish gray, and then their underside is a creamy pink color. They are pan-tropical, so found worldwide in tropical waters, again, out in the open ocean. And they will dive down to 500 meters to catch their fish and squid prey. So quite deep diving for quite a sm relatively small animal. A uh, striped dolphin, uh, about 2.6 meters, bluish gray, and then they have these white stripes, sort of like a Nike swoosh uh, down the side. And then they have a black line that goes from their eye all the way down the side of their body, like elongated eyeliner, you could call it. Uh, tropical and subtropical waters, and for these you, it's very common to see hundreds of them together. Hundreds together, kind of like a dolphin stampede. Hundreds together traveling. 
Um, they can be considered opportunistic feeders, taking all types of, uh, a lot of different types of fish, crustaceans, cephalopods, cephalopods being your squids, the cuttlefish, and octopus. A pan tropical spotted dolphin, again about 2.6 meters, gray. And in the adults, they will be covered in spots. Majority of the spots on their underside, but coming up the sides a little bit as well. As the name suggests, worldwide in the tropics. And they will feed at night on fish, uh, crustaceans, and squid again. We're getting a general theme here with the food. OK, our Rissos dolphin, up to about 3.8 meters, a very large, bulbous, rounded head. When they are born, they are fully dark gray. They are dark gray when they are born. As they age, as they hunt their squid, and the squid fight back and leave them scars, and when they fight each other, which they do a lot, and scratch each other with the teeth, they get these scars. Now these, these scratches, they heal. But when they heal, they heal without any pigment, without any color. So they just stay white. And then it's thought that females will sometimes use this as a sexual selection trait. So the whiter the male, it means he's been in more fights and he's survived. So he's stronger and fitter out of all of them. So pick me, pick me, basically. Our rough tooth dolphin, uh, about 2.8 meters, looks very, very primitive. Um, the head just sl gently slopes down to the beak sort of a gentle slope. Um, with these, it's very typical to find them covered in uh, cookie cutter scars. Cookie cutter is a type of shark. It stays in the darkness, deep, deep dwelling, and it's very small. And what they do is when there's a mammal or another animal diving down deep, they will swim up very quick, take a bite, and swim away. And their mouth, their jaw is very circular and they've just got rings of circular teeth, so they just leave a very rounded scar on these animals. Very much offshore, again, in the tropical waters, and fish and cephalopods on the diet again. Okay, we have our common bottlenose dolphin. Uh, these guys, 3.8 meters, and they are chunky where the other dolphins tend to be quite slender, a bit more streamlined. These guys are bulky, chunky animals, very stocky body. Very characteristic curve in the back of their dorsal fin. And they are found still worldwide. Worldwide, majority, um, mostly of the coastal distribution. Here in the tropics, they're a little bit smaller, uh, maybe sort of three and a half, between three and three and a half meters. It can get up to 3.8, and in some cases, 4 meters in temperate waters, for example, in the UK. And they are chunkier there as well. These are big guys, big beasts. Opportunistic in their feeding, fish, squid, uh, crustaceans. Uh, they quite like a lot of the flatfish, a lot of the flatfish as well. We have another type of bottlenose, uh, the Indo-Pacific bottlenose, only found in the Indian and Western Pacific Oceans. It is very difficult to tell these apart from the commons. They are a little bit smaller, maximum 2.7 meters, slightly sl more slender body. In relation to their body, their rostrum is slightly longer. So with the common bottlenose, it's a little bit stumpier. With these guys, it's just slightly longer. They prefer shallow waters, but again, they're feeding on very much the same food as the commons. With the Indo-Pacific, the adults will sometimes have spots on their underside. Uh, the commons won't develop these spots. The Indo-Pacifics occasionally will. Um, but in the wild, just seeing the dorsal fin surface, it's very difficult to tell commons and Indo-Pacific apart. You usually need to use genetics. All right, our spinner dolphins, um, quite small, 2.3 meters. So gray with this light stripe down the side of their body, a very long, long pointed rostrum. Only found in tropical waters worldwide. 